Good morning, Grace. I found my water bottle. Go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 1. That's where we're going to spend our time this morning in the Scripture. Uh, We'll be in verses 18 through 25. And just as you're getting there, if this is your first time, 100th time, or 113th time at Grace, I want to say welcome. Um, And thank you for coming. Today we're going to continue on with our Christmas story um, as we continue on through the Advent season. Today we're going to look at a faith that receives. Not just a faith that's standard or a faith that's um, expected, but a faith that has something in store. A faith that receives, and not just a past gift, but a present pleasure. So go ahead and start reading with me in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. It says this, The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. So this story is pretty straightforward. It's a classic. I'm sure we've all heard it a million times here and there throughout uh, various Christmas services. But before we kind of dive in and start breaking down the story that we just read, I want to take a moment and reflect on the prior 17 verses, the way that this book is opened, the way that this chapter is opened. So just real quick, just look through it. Just look through those first 17 verses. You don't necessarily have to read it, but just use, use your eyes and just scan through it real quick. You'll see a lot of names. And to spare you my probably inaccurate pronunciation of half of those names, I'm just going to summarize it and say this. This is the genealogy of Christ. This is from the beginning, from Adam, all the way up until Jesus. And this is his genealogy, his lineage. And the reason this is included here is because, well, first of all, the book is about Jesus. And I'm talking about the Bible. But secondly, because it's establishing something. It's establishing a continuation of God's plan. And that shows something that's really, really important. And if we miss this one thing, then the birth of Jesus means very little. It shows that God's plan didn't change. It shows that God's plan was set from the beginning of creation and it continued all the way up until Jesus' birth. Nothing changed. God's plan was still the same and is still the same today. And there's hope in that and there's joy in that. And that's why I want to make, take a moment and just make note of that because this demonstrates that God's plan didn't have to change. The failures of man were known and God's plan stayed the same. And here, we get to see God's plan come to fruition. Now, we understand that faith has a lot of different meanings in our world today, a lot of different uses. So I want to take a moment and just kind of define that from a biblical perspective. It says, faith is an act of belief in God demonstrated through obedience and love. Obedience and love, those are the two big ones that go with faith. But more than that, it's an active belief. It's not just a passive state of being. It's not something that you inherit because of your parents or inherit because of a prayer you said when you were in the third grade. Faith is an active, continuing understanding that is demonstrated through obedience and love. And that's very specifically obedience toward God and what He has declared and love toward the people because of what God has declared. That is what faith is. And we recognize from the passage that we read that faith begins in Christ. Look again at verse 24. It says this, When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her. Faith begins in Christ. It has to. If our faith begins anywhere else, if our faith begins in the world, if it begins in that prayer we said in third grade, if it begins in the people around us, 
then our faith has a poor and weak foundation. But faith begins in Christ, and it has to. And not because Christ was just some good guy, not because He was just a good man, but because Christ is God. And it's because Christ is God that we have this relationship with Him. And that is why faith must begin in Christ, because this is that same Christ from creation, that same Christ that fulfilled God's plan and allowed us to come to righteousness. Because in the, in the book of Hebrews, we are told that Christ is the fulfillment of the law, that law in which the Old Testament led the, the Israelites. Jesus fulfilled it so that we, the Gentiles, could come to know God. So faith begins in Christ. And we see that for Joseph and Mary by action, by obedience and love. And in us, we, we see that faith beginning in Christ because we are willing and able to speak up, to speak out, to do what He has called us to do. And that's in a very specific sense of the way that, that we do what God has called us to do. God has called all of us as believers to a lot of things, to obedience, to reading the Word, to prayer, to sharing the Gospel, to discipleship. But He's called each of us individually to very unique things. He has given us each very unique gifts and very unique ways in which we can love on the world, in which we can share the Gospel through it. In fact, as Paul is kind of explaining the way that God has given us different gifts, He, he gives us the image of a, of a physical body, that we are part of the body of Christ. He says some of us are the hands. Some of us do the physical work. Some of us are the feet. Some of us take the message out into the world. Some of us are the mouths. And it's very important to note that one of the things he doesn't list there is none of us are the butts. We can sit and we can be given the gospel, but we have to do something with it. And that faith begins in Christ. Now here at Grace, we have, we have a motto. We are to be the salt, the light, and the difference in Gardner and in our communities. We are to demonstrate Christ in all the things that we do. And so today, as we kind of look through this, as we see a faith that receives, I want to look at it very specifically through that light. I want to see how God is going to use our faith to impact Gardner. So faith begins in Christ. And for us, that means that we are the difference. We are humbling ourselves actively and prioritizing God at all times in our lives. Recognizing that we have hopes and goals and dreams for ourselves, for our children, for our loved ones. We have desires of the way we would like to see the nation change. We have desires of the way we'd like to see God impact our schools, impact our homes, impact the lost. And all that begins by being the difference by choosing to humble ourselves in pursuit of Christ, by choosing to place His goals above our own, by saying that He is more and we are less, because we have to be, because that faith begins in Christ. And if it begins in ourselves, if it begins in our capabilities, then it is fruitless. But it begins in Christ. It begins in Christ and it continues through resolution. Faith continues through resolution. Look at verse 20 with me. Verse 20 says this, But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel which is translated, God is with us. Faith continues through resolution. Notice that at the beginning of this, Joseph recognizes that his wife is pregnant. And he doesn't see it through rose-colored lenses. He sees it for what it is. Just in the same way that if you see somebody become pregnant that's not married, you probably have a lot of the same conclusions that Joseph probably did. So he comes to a natural conclusion. He decides to, out of his love for her, cut ties quietly, go back to their own lives. Have you ever had one of those things where you're kind of like, it's a big life decision or something that's really changed you and you're really thinking on it, you're really chewing on it late into the night, to the wee hours of the morning, you're just really just thinking over this thing and you can't get to sleep? That's where Joseph is here. And it says, suddenly in a dream, the angel spoke to him. 
Now, a lot of times throughout the scriptures, when we see the angels, when we see the prophets, the teachers of the Bible, sometimes they're very long-winded, and we're grateful for it. And this is one of those times when the angel's very brief. He's very to the point. And he says, Joseph, son of David, in other words, I know who you are, you know who I am, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will, take, he will save his people from their sins. And that's where the angel stops. A very brief, very fulfilling, and a very terrifying thing. Joseph was mulling over what to do. Joseph didn't know. He didn't know which way to go, which way was the right decision, and he was truly considering what to do. Because while God has given us each different gifts and different abilities, He's given us all a brain. He's given us all free will, and we are to utilize it for His glory. And that's what we see Joseph doing here. He was acting on faith. He's saying, God, I know that you are good. God, I know you can work through this situation as you have worked through everything else in my life. And we know that Joseph was a wise man. So let's take it a little bit farther. Let's say that he was looking back on his lineage, looking back on the people who came before him, saying, God, I know that you worked through my great times 13 grandfather David. I know that you worked through him when, when he had a child out of wedlock. God, I know that you've worked through the unfaithfulness of man before, and I know you can do it again, but what do I do? Do I stay? Do I go? We are to mull over the things of this world. We can trust and have faith in the fact that God moves mountains on behalf of His chosen. We can have trust and faith in the fact that God saves. But we are still to prepare for it. We are still to act in preparation for Christ. Because faith begins in Christ. We have to do all things in His name. And faith continues through resolution. And that's where we see Joseph and Mary here. They considered what was coming. They considered what to do. And then when God spoke, they were ready. And for us, we continue our faith and resolution through obedience to God. Now, obedience to God at times lines up with obedience to the world. And that's good. And there's times when obedience to God disagrees with obedience to the world. And that's when we continue to obey God. We demonstrate our resolution in prayer. Paul says that we are to be continuously in prayer, always in a state of worship, always seeking to glorify God, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we're doing it for Christ. We demonstrate it through, <clears throat> excuse me, through studying the Scriptures. Now, this isn't just a passive studying the Scriptures or a passive hearing it on Sunday mornings and calling it good for the week. This is always finding ourselves in the Scriptures, either reading on it or meditating on it or practicing it or praying it, always using God's Word. Because this is essentially the guidebook that He's given us to life. It says all of the things you're going to go through in life, either generally or specifically, are addressed here. And we're to utilize it so that we can be A, fulfilled, and B, equipped so that we can C, be sent. That is His purpose. Now, this faith continues through resolution and fellowship, that we would be equipped and able to spend time with like-minded individuals. And as we get into the holiday season, I think that's something that we can all be excited for, whether it's fellowship with family or whether it's fellowship with church family, with friends, with loved ones. But don't allow fellowship to just be a surface-level thing. Dive into that fellowship. Be renewed in your fellowship. And in service. We're to demonstrate our faith through resolution and demonstrate it through service. If you can serve in the physical church building, that's amazing. If you can serve in the physical church body, that's amazing. If you can serve your family, serve your spouse, serve your children, serve your parents, that's amazing. God gives us opportunities to demonstrate obedience. And that's why faith is active. Because we have to do it, but not just do it in a state of getting it done or checking it off a list, but do it in a way that we demonstrate love to the people around us. Because faith continues through resolution. It begins in Christ, and it results in obedience. Look at verse 24 one more time with me. It says this, When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. 
He married her, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Faith results in obedience. For Joseph and for Mary, the obedience is pretty straightforward, and, and the angel, the messenger of God, was, was pretty clear on what was expected. The angel said, your wife-to-be, Mary, is going to have a son, and you'll name him Jesus. So, Joseph awoke. Married Mary. Right? Yeah. And he had a son. And he named him Jesus. Now in that case, it was pretty straightforward instructions. Open up the bag of pizza rolls. Put it on a plate. Throw it in the microwave. Done. Pizza rolls are made. A little bit of ranch to go with it. It's a great time. And I think that maybe that mentality is what we should use when we look at a lot of the things God has equipped us to do. Because God has called us to share the gospel. The Great Commission is very clear. We are to go into the world to share the gospel with all peoples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Christ and discipling them into the things that He has taught us. And that command, I think, scares a lot of Christians. Because they say, how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to know how to do that? And yet it's just as simple as the microwave Tostinos. It's just as simple as having a wife and having a son and naming that son Jesus, at least in the case of Joseph. We are simply to do it. But we are to do it in faith, not believing that it is all on us because it isn't, but trusting in the fact that Christ has given us the tools we need and the ways we need to do it and that we need to be faithful to execute it at a high level because Christ demands our obedience. Because faith begins in Christ. And through that act of faith, we are the difference in our communities. We humble ourselves in prioritizing God at all times. Faith continues through resolution. And through that, we are the light. We are providing gentleness, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control to those around us. We are an example of godliness. And as faith results in obedience, we are the salt. We are an example of personality and of respectability in our communities. We are somebody that they want to get to know because we have the light in our lives. And we need to act like it. Because God is God. And He demands that we live in respect of that. And this isn't just God the Almighty in which we bow down before His throne, though it definitely is. Because this is God the Creator. God the one who had the power to write the cosmos into existence with the speaking of a word. And this is God the Father, the one who sacrificed His Son so that we wretches would live. God the Father who cares for us, who longs to have a relationship with us. In fact, I was watching a video just yesterday. It was of the Pope. He was talking about how it's dangerous to have a personal relationship with Christ, to seek one. Now, the point of view he was getting at was he was saying that to have a personal relationship with Christ is heretical because humans couldn't, because they need an intercessory peace, i.e. the Pope. I disagree with that. But I do agree that having a personal relationship with Christ is dangerous because to have a personal relationship with the Creator, the God, the Father, is to say, hey, I recognize that I am failure. I recognize that I am broken. And I need you to fix me. And when we ask God to fix us, when we ask Him to enter into our lives, we're saying, take me and mold me. Remove the things that I don't need. Add the things that I do need so that I can serve you. We're not seeking to make ourselves better for our own purpose. We're not trying to seek ourselves and, and make ourselves great or make a name for ourselves. We are trying to glorify God. And when we seek a relationship with the Creator, He's going to do it. He's going to shape us. There are some branches in our lives He's going to cut. And there are some things in our life that He's going to change. So, to that point, a blind squirrel does find a nut sometimes. But God is God. He is Creator, He is Father, and He is Judge. He says that sin is unacceptable. And in our world, we see that sin is accepted. So we cannot just casually accept the sin of our lives and the sin of our neighbors, but we must pray and trust God that He would move mountains, 
in our own lives if we are devoted to him and have that relationship, then we are to ask him for his blessing. Then we are to ask him to cleanse us, to repent of our sins. And in the sins of the people around us, we are to pray that God would change them. And that when he moves, we would be ready to act. Because while God can move in a person's life all on his own because he is God, he's given us them in our lives for a reason. He's allowed us to interact with them, to talk to them, to love on them so that they would see the light. And not just in a passive state that they would see the light without us ever saying a word, but that we would be able to tell them that there is hope and that we have a faith that receives. You might be thinking, Tyler, faith is great and all. But what am I supposed to have faith in? Have you seen my life? Have you seen the things that I've gone through? Have you seen the world? And I'll say yes. Because there is things that we can have faith in. We can have faith in who God is. We can have faith in the characteristics of God. That He is loving. That He is righteous. That He is merciful. We can have faith in the fact that this is the same God who saved the Israelites from occupation, that saved the Israelites from idolatry, that saved the Israelites from the Israelites. We can have faith in the fact that this is the same God who recognizes sin and knows sin. And this is the same God who sees our sin and loves us anyways. We can have faith in the fact that God is our salvation. We can have faith in the fact of what God has done. We can look at all of the things in the Old Testament as a source of encouragement. We can look at all of the things in the New Testament as a source of encouragement. We can look at the people around us, our church family, and see sources of encouragement and exaltation. Because if God can do in me what He has done in me, then I'm sure He can do something great in you. We can have faith in what God is doing. We can have faith in the fact that God is moving within our church that He is utilizing our church to move in our community. Look at what Grace has done in the last three months, the last six, the last 12, the last four years, the last 10. God is using the people of Grace to expand His mission in Gardner. And He's not just stopping in Gardner. He's utilizing the people of Grace and the people that He has touched throughout the world to reach the world. And we can have faith in that. We can have faith in where God is leading. We can have faith in the fact that God has put strong and wise people as leadership over this church body. We can have faith in the fact that God is leading us somewhere. You can have faith in the fact that God is leading you somewhere. That your life is not without purpose. That your life is not without reason. And we can have faith in why God allows these things. For those of you who didn't join us last week, this, this may be something you have to take a second to do. But for those of, you, those of you who were here last week, I ask you to be very real with the burdens in your life. I ask you to be very honest and open with yourself about the things that are weighing you down. So I want you all to take a second, go find that bag in your mental closet where you probably threw it shortly after Sunday. Go find that mental bag, find that mental luggage. And I want you to recognize that you can have faith and why God is allowing these things to happen. Because, yes, life is hard. Yes, your burdens are real. But you have a God who cares about them. You have a God who sees your burdens and gives you the strength to endure, gives you the people to do it with, gives you the people to do it for. God allows you to be you in light of himself. There are burdens that God removes from our lives, just as there are burdens that he doesn't. But God is still God. And as we recognize that this faith that receives is real. As we recognize that it is momentous. As we recognize that it is a burden. We must recognize what it receives. In the case of Joseph and Mary, they received that baby, Jesus. And in the case of us, we receive Jesus all the same. For while now he is no longer an infant, now we recognize that he is salvation. That he was born those 2,000 years ago, raised as a man, completely human, completely God, to die at our hands. We humans tried so hard to distance ourselves from God that we literally killed him. 
And yet he rose from the grave, demonstrating that we could not hold him back, demonstrating that death could not hold him back because Christ defeated sin. He defeated those natural tendencies in our lives to stray away from him. He defeated our ability to do so if we have faith in him. That by our faith, we are given righteousness. And by our righteousness, we are redeemed. Not that we're made perfect. We still stumble. We still fall. But that we have hope. And that we have an active and growing faith. For after he was redeemed from the grave, after he arose, he didn't just say, all right, good luck, see ya. He gave us hope of a future. He gave us this great gospel that we can carry on our own shoulders and exalt those around us to do the same. And that is a faith that receives because we have received the gospel. And now we must go out into the world. At least, maybe most of us, some of us. If you haven't received the gospel, if you don't have faith in Christ, if you don't know who that is or what to do, if you're confused, then Paul is clear about what we're supposed to do. Paul says we are supposed to wrestle with our salvation. We are supposed to consider it strongly and decide for ourselves what we would do. Because if I'm right that Jesus is the way to God, that Jesus is the only way, and that through Him and through our faith in Him we are redeemed, then there is everlasting glory and joy at the cross. And if I'm wrong, at least I'm going to be a good person while doing it. But we're not saved by our logic. We're not saved by our advanced understandings of the scriptures or of the people of the world or of our financial security. We are saved by faith in Christ. And sometimes it's a faith that doesn't understand all the details. Sometimes it's a faith that's resolute in what we don't know. But we can have knowledge of this. Christ was born of a virgin. Christ died after living a perfect life so that he could save some extremely unperfect people. We can have faith in who God is, of what God has done, of what he is doing, of the things he's moving in our life, and of the people he's placed in it. And we can have faith in what God allows the trials that he's given us. We can have faith in recognizing that there is a purpose behind our lives, that there is hope of a future. This is a faith that receives Because Christ is worth sharing. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you for today. For letting us worship you boldly and openly at your cross. God, I ask that you would be with all of us as we recognize that this faith that we have received is a gift that you have given us through your own death. God, I ask that you would help us to recognize who you are. That you are righteous. That you are Father. That you are Savior. And God, help us to live like it. God, help us to recognize that our lives don't have to be pointless. That you give us hope. That you give us purpose. And God, I ask that as we go out into the world, you would allow us to be your servants. Allow us to be sent by you. Help us to live in light of the faith that you've given us. And God, allow us to be active in it. Help us to engage in the reading of Scripture. Help us to engage in prayer. Help us to engage in fellowship and in service. Not so that we would have a good time on earth, but so we would have a God-honoring time. Because we live for you, and we must live for you. God, for those in the room who don't know you, who don't have a relationship with you, I ask that you would exalt within them a spirit of openness. God, I ask that you would move within them, that you would allow them to see you. Because, God, we know that you are present in the valleys. We know that you are present on the mountains of our lives. And I ask that you would continue to be with us, God, as we go out into the world. Help us to be your servants. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.